Right, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen, it's Anthony Carpen here at the Ascension Parish Burial Ground. So I'm just south of Huntington Road, just north of Churchill College for those of you who are familiar with, uh, with the city. And you can see the grave behind me is that of um, two of my civic heroes. This is Sir Horace Darwin and his wife Lady Ida Darwin, who were two of the people who really made modern Cambridge. So as you can see... With the um, with the graveyard um, behind me, full of very very famous names, um, and the uh, keepers and volunteers have got their work cut out, obviously trying to um, to to keep it in order. Which it's it's a shame that there's not more of us in the city who um, you know can't come along here and uh, and help out because um, for me both Sir Horace and Lady Ida Darwin. Um, two very, very prominent names in our civic history. I won't go too far because obviously, as you can see, the light is um, variable. And um, as you can guess by the surname Darwin, um, Horace has a relation to the botanist Charles. In fact, Charles was his father. And three of Charles Darwin's sons actually got knighthoods. Uh, another one buried here, Sir Francis. Um, is another grave that I'll be um, on the lookout for. Um, but what was significant about um, Sir Horace Darwin uh, is he was the founder of the Cambridge Scientific Instrument Company, which would go on to become one of the biggest employers in Cambridge during the early to middle part of the 20th century. And one of the things that the company did, in particular during the First World War, was it came up with a whole series of inventions to deal with the horrors of trench warfare. And uh, Sir Horace actually got a knighthood for his troubles. His wife, um, Lady Ida, would go on to become one of the most prominent mental health campaigners in Cambridge uh, during the early to mid 20th century um, uh, campaigner alongside Florence Ada Keynes of all people. Um, Florence was um, worked with pretty much everyone, anyone who was anyone um, in uh, in those days but um, Ida was so splendid in what she did that we actually named a hospital after actually on the other side of town the Ida Darwin up in Fullbourne um, and it's in this little tucked away corner of northwest Cambridge that we find that um, that the two of them are are buried. We've also got another significant um, grave here and this is of the Heightlands. Now it's not William that I'm interested in, um, a fellow of St John's College, but actually his wife Margaret, because Margaret was one of the most prominent suffragist campaigners for the Cambridge Women's Suffrage Society. And um, some time ago, um, when going through the county archives, I found a whole host of minutes and minute books and pamphlets that she had written and signed off. And one of them is actually really significant. It's actually um, dated from 1913, um, at a time when um, the suffragists were on the really on the move, um, and they um, marched all the way to London for this big pilgrimage to petition Lloyd George and Asquith um, to make the case for votes for women. But it was also the time when the suffragettes, so this is Emily and Pankhurst and friends, were also really picking up speed in terms of their campaign of very violent direct action. And it was on the back of some of those actions in 1913 that persuaded enough members of parliament not to back the reform bill um, that would have removed the ban on women voting for members of parliament um, and if you look in the archives and I'll see if I can pull it out when they reopen again Margaret wrote this furious letter to her fellow members of the Cambridge Women's Suffrage Society and bear in mind this was one of the biggest societies in Cambridge at the time over 500 women alone were members of it 
and the suffragists the suffragettes in Cambridge were actually a lot smaller and it was Olive Bartels who was primarily the main mover um, for th that movement in in Cambridge but the number of names that were actually involved was much much smaller and so Margaret Highland was absolutely spitting with rage and fire but also saying to her fellow members you know not to give up and to carry on campaigning and ultimately victory would be theirs as it ultimately uh, was um, though not until 1928 when we got um, universal, universal and equal suffrage um, and there are two things that I find really interesting with this one if you go to the National Archives, I've got a number of um, friends, colleagues and contacts who work in um, that field who kind of bounce off each other in terms of research. And they discovered a list of all of the women, I think it was, who were arrested. Um, and the Home Office at the time um, kind of kept a list of all of, <laughs> all of those people who had been convicted. Um, I think it was convicted, not arrested, but the point being is that there was a civil servant in the Home Office who put a file note um, as the file was due to be archived and said, actually, this is going to be a very, very significant list for future historians in, you know, decades, centuries to come by, look after it. Um, and he was writing at a time when women still didn't have the votes so an incredible piece of foresight on on the part of the civil servant there and secondly fast forwarding to um uh, to 1928 um i'm actually glad for um millicent garrett Fawcett, who obviously has spent a lot of time in um in this city and who we unveiled a blue plaque to not so long ago um and that she lived long enough to see her dream of votes for women um, and universal suffrage come true because she started campaigning on the issue very, very early in her um, adulthood, around the time that she married um, another hero of this town, Professor Henry Fawcett, who, um, despite being blinded in a shooting accident, became one of the most prominent and progressive cabinet ministers of his day in the 1860s, 18, um, 1870s. And he died at the untimely age of 51, I believe, in 1884. And um, the newspapers of the day document his huge funeral procession up in Trumpington. He's actually buried not in this cemetery, but out in um, the cemetery um, in Trumpington. I think one of the pieces of work I'd love to see a, a researcher or a scholar do at some stage is kind of a joint biography of both... Um, Millicent uh, and Henry Fawcett and how the two of them worked together on the various different causes that they worked on. Um, it's also one of those things that I kind of w wonder what would have happened, what would have been the course of history given how prominent and given how highly respected Professor Fawcett was um, and he missed out on being Cambridge's MP um, by not much in the, the 1860s, he actually stood for Parliament for the Liberal Party, um, ultimately getting elected, uh, funnily enough, in what I'm beginning to see as Cambridge's sister city of Brighton, um, not least because I, um, I spent my university days um, down there on the south coast and the links between Cambridge and Brighton seem to be kind of like growing stronger and stronger, not least because we now have a direct train route. Um, and I know of a number of people who've actually gone from Brighton to Cambridge and from Cambridge to Brighton um, permanently. But coming back to the Fawcett's, I kind of wonder what the path of government would have been, in particular on votes for women, but not just that, but on a whole host of other issues, had Professor Fawcett lived. Because if he had lived, let's say, to the age of 80, that's 84, 94, 04, 14... What would have been the course of that Liberal government between 1906, which was when Cambridge actually got its first proper Liberal MP, this was Stanley Buckmaster KC, who would later go on to become the Lord Chancellor and also the um, President of the Law Society um, that would ultimately remove the ban on women serving um, as lawyers, because in then women couldn't actually be practising in... Um, in law, but he was the person who overturned it. 
So what would have been the effect of all of that had Professor Fawcett been kind of like there um, in the run-up to and during the years of um, the premiership? So first of all, Sir Henry Campbell Bannerman and then later um, Asquith. I'd like to think they would have got votes for women out of the way done and dusted um, a lot more quickly than they ended up doing and you know who knows what it could have meant for the Liberal Party but you know um, we live in interesting times. Anyway I'm off to find um, the grave of Sir Francis Darwin because it's his daughter Frances Cornford um, who I'm particularly interested in and I'll tell you why in a separate video.